Next, from Springfield, we talk to Bill Clutter, private investigator and principal founder of the Downstate Illinois Innocence Project at the University of Illinois at Springfield. We talk to Mr. Clutter about his years of working to free the wrongfully convicted and the extensive problems within Illinois' and America's criminal justice system. This runs about 45 minutes. Bill Clutter, thank you for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, you have been investigating, uh, well, you've been an investigator for 30 years, and you somewhat migrated along the way into investigating wrongfully convicted. Right. Some of those murder cases, some of them, what, might also be like uh, rape cases? De death penalty cases, for the most part. Um, of the death penalty case, how long have you been on the innocence, uh, working with those who are wrongfully convicted? No. Well, you know, I, was, I had the good fortune of getting involved in the innocence movement back in the late 1980s in Illinois. Uh, it was on the case of Rolando Cruz. He had been on death row. He had been twice convicted, um, sentenced to death, conviction reversed. And the only thing that saved his life at his second sentencing hearing in 1990 was the director of... Uh, State, well, I should back up. The only thing that saved our client's life, our co-defendant, was uh, Alejandro Hernandez. You know, Rolando Cruz, a lot of people know about his case because he was twice sentenced to death row. Our client, Alejandro Hernandez, also charged of this very heinous crime in DuPage County. His life was saved because of the testimony of the director of the Illinois State Police after our client was reconvicted in 1991, uh, the director of state police, acting as director of state police, came in and testified that his department investigated the real killer and that Alejandro Hernandez was innocent. And that was the only thing that spared his life the second time he was convicted. He would later be released, um, but it would take another six years. And that was a brown chicken, was it? No, that was uh, that was the Janine Nicarico. That's right. That's the case that involved the politics of Jim Ryan running for attorney general. Um, it became a campaign issue when Lisa Madigan ran against Joe Burkett in uh, 2002. Uh, it's one of the cases that's cited. It's cited as, as the first death penalty DNA exoneration in Illinois. Well, the DNA that exonerated Rondo Cruz was brought to light in 1988. But despite that evidence, he would be reconvicted of a crime he didn't commit. And despite the fact that his DNA was excluded, you know, where he had evidence of. She had been what, raped and murdered? She had been raped and murdered. And this is a 10 year old child. And you had uh, an exclusion of uh, Alejandro Hernandez, his co-defendant. You had a full profile match of Brian Dugan. And then there wasn't, um, Cruz, he wasn't fully excluded because of the um, DNA technology wasn't as sophisticated as today, and it's still evolving. But, um, but with, with Cruz, he couldn't be fully eliminated because of the possibility of um, the DNA Mix the mixture with the, with the victim. Now, first of all, just again, this is somewhat more on background. So the name of the victim was? Janina Carrico. And she was 10 years old? 10 years old, abducted from her home in Naperville, Illinois. And do you remember the year she was murdered? Uh, 1980, uh, 1983, I believe, yeah. Uh, and how long after was were the two uh, defendants? Uh, there was three people indicted a year later, and it was uh, they were indicted a, a week before the primary election for DuPage County State's Attorney. And it was one of those things where the Republican candidates vying for state's attorney, you know, if they won the primary, they won the general election. And in that case, um, the sitting state's attorney was defeated by Jim Ryan, the challenger. And of course, the Nicarico case was a big issue, um, even though. So the DNA, when it was first introduced in that case, was what year, Jim? Uh, well, the DNA, it was the first 
death penalty case in Illinois where DNA was used to exclude the, um, the accused. And uh, that was 1988 when that test was run. It was presented at an evidentiary hearing a year later. And, uh, you know, despite that evidence, you know, Cruz got reconvicted. Even though it, it was a full profile match to a serial killer who had confessed that he alone killed Janine Nicarico, prosecutors in DuPage County stuck, I mean, they, they held steadfast to their position that uh, these two Hispanics had committed the crime, that it was a gang of burglars. Yeah, and that, uh, you know, they, they took the position that, um, you know, that Dugan was a liar when he said he killed Janine Nicarico. They tried to exclude his testimony was, from being now, heard. Who actually killed uh, A guy named Brian Dugan. He was a serial killer. He's on. He, he was ultimately, 20 plus years later, prosecuted, um, I think it was around... The, well, it was around the time that Joe Burkett was wanting to run for uh, uh, elective office. And I think the year was, uh, oh, it was just recently, within the last 10 years. Dugan this, received this a, Dugan, was he one of the three that was indicted at the time? No, for? no. He was unknown until um, he committed a, a crime very similar to the murder of Junior Nicarico. He abducted two girls off their bicycle. They were young. I mean, they were under 10. One girl escaped, gave a description of the vehicle. Dugan was apprehended. And the investigator in DuPage County, who resigned after prosecutors indicted these two Hispanics and a third individual, Stephen Buckley, this uh, detective, um, uh, John Sam, resigned because he said, you've got the wrong guys. The person that did this is still out there. I'm going to continue to investigate. After getting reprimanded, you know, time after time for, you know, continuing to investigate, he's the one that noticed the similarities when he read about the Melissa Ackerman murder. She had been sodomized, similar to Junior Nicarico, um, similar in age, um, and he's the one that contacted his old partner at the DuPage County Sheriff's Department. And this was in uh, uh, 1985, June of 1985. And he said, this is the person you need to look at. And so after uh, contacting his former supervisor, Brian Dugan gets paid a visit by uh, a detective. And by this time, the detective realized that he matched the suspect description had dark brown hair in his late 20s, early 30s. Brian Dugan was 27, had brown hair. That the vehicle that he owned matched the suspect description, a box-shaped green car missing a hubcap, uh, which, you know, that matched Dugan's car to a T. And then the investigator went to his work, where he was working at the time, and learned that Dugan failed to show up at work on the day Janina Carrico was abducted and killed. And so the next visit was to the LaSalle County Jail. He first compared notes with the lead detective there, um, Tom Templeton, realized that both victims had been sodomized, and then he went in and asked Dugan, where were you on this date when this murder happened? And Dugan took the fifth, consulted with his attorney, and then later reached out to DuPage County because the state's attorney in LaSalle County was offering to spare Dugan's life in exchange for his plea of guilty in the Melissa Ackerman murder. And that he knew that he was under investigation for a third murder in uh, Kane County, which he pled guilty to, that he, um, in exchange for pleading guilty, they agreed not to seek the death penalty. And then there was one other murder, DuPage County, where he had already been put on notice that he's a suspect. And when they uh, contacted DuPage County, DuPage County's position was, we've already got two guys on death row. We're not interested. And then later, the subject of an indictment by a special prosecutor against two former assistant state's attorneys of DuPage County 
was that they came down, met with Dugan and his attorney, and never disclosed their handwritten notes of the information he gave them on that day. Bill, given your experience over 30 years of investigating where a number of these people have, who've been convicted and gone to death row, uh, have been then exonerated, why does this happen? Do you see any patterns? And is it, is it politics? Is it the pressure of the people to say, find someone right away? Why is our criminal justice system breaking down that we see, uh, certainly in the last 20 years, so many people being exonerated from the Illinois yeah, prisons? Yeah. You know, I think the bottom line is that anytime you have people involved in a process like this, you're going to have mistakes. I mean, we all make mistakes. But when it happens on this scale, where it involves the death penalty, or sending someone to prison for the rest of their life, um, you know, we need to make sure that we get it right. And, you know, I think a lot of the problem stems from the pressure when you have a crime that's very sensational. There is a lot of pressure to resolve and solve a crime like that. Um, you get, um, you know, some police investigators that maybe you know, the, you know they, they get into what's called um, tunnel vision, where they lock in on a suspect, and then they try to force the facts to fit their theory without keeping an objective, open mind to the investigation. I think that that, more than anything, in my experience, has been one of the, you know, the common factors. But there's all kinds of things. There's... Um, you know, there's laboratory fraud in some cases. There's been purposely, or is purposely. it just purposely? In some cases, it's been uh, deliberate, where you have uh, a DNA analyst in West Virginia, Fred Zane, who was fabricating uh, identifications involving DNA. You know, DNA, which is supposed to be the gold standard of our forensic science. Um, and then you get junk science. You get, you know, right now, I mean. You know, the well is starting to run low on DNA exonerations, but you have now a, an emphasis with the Innocence Project to look at these, the diagnosis of shaken baby syndrome, that a lot of, the, a lot of that is based on um, theories that science has failed to validate. The idea that, um, you know, you can shake a child and that would be enough force to cause bleeding of the brain. We now know that there's a lot of... Um, there's things like childhood stroke that cause the brain vessels to burst and, and to bleed. But yet, uh, innocent caregivers, innocent parents, when a child presents with the triad of symptoms of uh, bleeding of the brain, swelling of the brain, and retinal hemorrhaging, that in the past has been diagnosed, diagnostic of abusive uh, head trauma, where now the science realizes there's other causes. What do you say to those who would say, you know, here, here's a guy who's a, a, a bleeding heart and uh, probably never thinks any of these people are guilty when a lot of the people hearing this, the man on the street, we think oh, they're probably guilty of sin. But what would you say to those no. who bring up that kind of an aspect? Well, um, you know, I try to base my opinions on these cases based on, on the evidence and the facts. Uh, I don't see every case as a case of actual innocence. I mean, I, I know when people write to the Innocence Project, when I was involved uh, here at UIS, uh, I'd have cases I worked on where I knew they weren't innocent, but yet requested our services. But then you have, um, you know, this isn't just bleeding heart liberals that are concerned about this issue. Many of the cases that I've been involved in had, you know, some of the heroes in these uh, exonerations have been those within law enforcement that recognized that we got the wrong person, that the real killer is still out there, and we have to, we, we can't allow this to happen. On that level, it's about, uh, you know, justice for the victims, but it's also justice for the people that are wrongfully incarcerated. And so I've seen people that consider that call themselves conservative cops um, become very bothered 
by what's happened in our judicial system. Um, so, you know, my experience has been that it's those conservatives within law enforcement that become the more vocal about this issue. There's also going to be those who say, uh, one of the reasons that we send these people off to death row is because our criminal justice system is racist and that we're sending away uh, any number of black individuals or Hispanic individuals, members of minority. And yet, uh, while there certainly are members of the minority uh, demographics who have been wrongfully convicted, some of the most notable cases you've worked on have been not only of Caucasians, but in one instance over in Indiana. A police officer. Uh, it was a state police officer. Right, that's right. Who was ironic, not ironically, but shockingly uh, railroaded, I would say, by the system. By his own department. By his own department, which I found uh, incredible when he told his story. Yeah. That and here he was playing basketball, I think, with something. Like right. That. He had an alibi of 11 people. Uh, this is the case of David Cam just outside Louisville. It's the, the case that really inspired me to, you know, create a national organization investigating innocence of private investigators to, to, to go beyond Illinois to work these cases. But in that case, you know, David Kim gets accused of killing his wife and two children. Um, you know, both children, one, uh, his daughter was five and his son was seven. And, you know, when I talk about tunnel vision, there's classic tunnel vision because immediately he was pointed to as the sus first suspect. And police investigators ignored evidence of the crime scene, a prison-issued sweatshirt that had the DNA and the nickname of the killer etched in the back collar he had just been released from prison, and his sweatshirt was left at the crime scene. Uh, they totally ignored that, and it took the insistence of David Cam and his attorneys to finally have the unknown male DNA profile from the collar, the wearer's DNA, run through CODIS, the FBI database, that identified the real killer. It took four years after he had been convicted. People will hear this and say, how is it possible? I mean, none of us would want to be in this position, certainly to have our family killed, but they would think if I'm out playing basketball with 11 right. individuals, right. wouldn't that provide me with an airtight right. alibi? And yet not only was this man convicted, he had to go through three trials before he was exonerated. Before, How is that possible? Yeah, and what that case also sh shows is if it can happen to David Kim, it can happen to anybody in America, not white, black, but anybody. Um, this is an issue that crosses all social, economic, racial barriers because it can happen to anyone in America. Again, we talked earlier about uh, the idea that people who want to get people out of prison are bleeding heart, but the fact is I think, I think people would be shocked at the level of incompetence and corruption in the criminal justice system. And especially when you try to expose evidence of someone's innocence, the system has a tendency to circle the wagons and to fend off and to protect the conviction at any cost. And a lot of times that involves, um, you know, m misconduct on the part of prosecutors who got it wrong. Do you know uh, in your, again, from a, how long have you been in, in and you started 30 years being an investigator, years. but how long were you uh, working on the Innocence Project? Yeah, I was uh, director of investigations for 10 years with the Illinois Innocence Project. I, in fact, I started the Illinois Innocence Project. And what year was that? 2001. Uh, do you know since 2001, do you, do you happen to know off the top of your head how many people have been exonerated and released from prison? I don't have the exact number, but I know that as I do presentations, I have a PowerPoint that has the number of, of people who have been exonerated uh, since DNA, just, just DNA exonerations. And every time I give that lecture, I have to change the numbers because it, it changes from day to week. In fact, this, uh, just this week, I said uh, the other day, as we taped this UIS, uh, Larry Goldman is at, uh, over at the University of Illinois Springfield, uh, had another individual in the Chicagoland area that they had worked on uh, released from prison. It was a DNA exoneration, right? And it was a second second person in within about two weeks. Right. Uh, so DNA was one of the big game changers. 
that was a big game changer. Um, and I think more than anything, it's caused a, 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 an examination of the problems with the criminal justice system, and particularly like with the death penalty exonerations, because at that level, you know, you're dealing with governors and states that are, you know, set to execute people. And when you, you know, uh, you talk about conservatives, um, you know, George Ryan was one of the more conservative politicians in state government. And he did a 180 when he began to realize that there's these, uh, there's a parade of these people coming out of prison who have been wrongfully convicted. Um, and it really shakes the confidence in a system uh, when you have that happen. Am I correct that the last person to put to death would that have been under George Ryan? It was under George Ryan. In fact, he, I think that execution took place, um, it was right after Anthony Porter was released. I think that execution was right, either right before, but I think it might have been right after. And I think that's what gave George Ryan some pause about the death penalty. When you, uh, we had talked about DNA being a game changer, to what extent, and, and well, and, and from these people being released, we just said George Ryan, the governor of Illinois, from elected in 98 and went out of office at uh, the end of, well, January of 2003. George Ryan changed his ways. To what extent has the system changed its way? Changed its way, saying, obviously, we've been making some mistakes. We need to. Yeah. up our game, put some protections in here. Has the system responded to this realization that any number of people have been wrongfully convicted? You know, there, there have been commissions set up to study and to enact reforms. And, you know, there's been reforms that have been put in place to try to prevent uh, wrongful convictions, particularly in death penalty cases. But what I see year after year are you know, prosecutors charging, you know, people that I know to be innocent, um, and, and it hasn't really changed that. Um, and I don't know what the answer is. I'm, it's... Um, These days, we, uh, do we always videotape well, interrogations? We, we now inter in videotape interrogations, but it, it doesn't really, hasn't really changed the fact that innocent people still are being charged with crimes, still being convicted of crimes. Um, and I don't really know how we change that, or if we can. One of the items uh, that people who don't follow this might be shocked is that, it, it, I would presume, I don't know, in cases where there would be DNA evidence, such as in a rape or perhaps a a murder, in any case where there'd be any DNA evidence, uh, typically DNA evidence would be gathered. If it's a rape, there would be DNA evidence taken in a rape kit, right? But there are m thousands of these evidence, uh, pieces of evidence sitting untested uh, because of the cost of testing. Uh, and running the DNA evidence. What is your take on that, and to what extent should we say, as a society, anytime there is evidence gathered, we ought to make sure that we go ahead and run that test and, and see if the accused DNA matches the evidence? Mm -hmm. and, and secondly, to what extent are we allowing any number of a uh, individuals who are guilty to remain free because we would have found them to right, be guilty, right. but for their evidence not having been tested. Yeah, and that, that's a big issue because in these cases that have occurred, a rape that may have occurred then 30 years ago, you know, they, you know, collect, you know, the, the, um, the rape kit and they store it away, but a lot of the storage techniques, um, are less than ideal. Um, so In what way? even if that evidence still exists, the evidence may have degraded or um, 
How long can DNA, do we know how long DNA would, would stay well, and could you be know, tested? DNA can uh, last, uh, you know, many years. I mean, I've had, there's been cases uh, 20, 30 years old where you get DNA, but, you know, if it's not uh, correctly stored, if it's, you know, um, you know, if it's allowed to, um, you know, get, you know, condensation collecting, if it's stored in a plastic bag, it'll degrade. If it's uh, exposed to heat or moisture, it'll degrade. Um, so, I mean, it's... Should we mandate that these uh, be tested? And can, uh, is, that, is that part of the reforms? And, and would there be, uh, what, what problems would we have with mandating that? Well, I think that, I, you know, I think, well, we do have an evidence preservation statute in Illinois. It requires that evidence in uh, murders and, um, and I believe it applies to rape cases as well, that that be preserved. Um, and, you know, as far as addressing the storage conditions and the testing, and, and I don't know that we've figured that out because it's really a funding issue. It's a, a providing the funding to test the evidence. I know that the Illinois State Police applies for federal grants to do that testing, and, you know, it's, it's um, you know, it, it, there's some effort to have that done. But, you know, I would, you know, ask this. I mean, you know, what, you know, what I see in some cases is where somebody who uh, wants that evidence tested, why, why are we still having prosecutors uh, objecting to those m motions and fighting to prevent the testing of forensic evidence? Why do we? I, you know, that's a great question because uh, to me, it's an obstruction of justice when a prosecutor is opposing testing on a person who's uh, asserting their innocence, like Jerry Hobbs in Lake County. You know, he came off of, uh, he was, he spent five years in the Lake County jail awaiting death penalty charges, was released in 2010 after um, a judge finally ordered that the DNA, the semen that was collected from the rape kit of his eight-year-old daughter, I believe she was eight, she was under 10, who's found murdered. Prosecutors prevented and tried to block having the unknown male DNA profile run in CODIS to identify who left the semen. Once they eliminated Jerry Hobbs, they had no interest in knowing the truth because they'd already charged Jerry Hobbs, who allegedly confessed falsely. But yet we see time and time after, again, uh, what happened in Lake County is they fight and block to have that evidence tested. Is and your contention that uh, prosecutors are more interested in logging a victory than in achieving justice? In that case, yes. Um, in that case. And I think part of it is that they don't want to know the truth. They want to prevent the truth from coming out because to know the truth uh, could be embarrassing. It could be One that they sent the wrong man to prison. Yeah, that they charged the wrong person, uh, didn't fully investigate the case and allowed the real killer to go off and kill again, which, which is what happened in that case. Uh, the governor, Governor Rauner, is now forming a uh, commission to look at reforms to our criminal justice system. From your perspective, what would you, if you were testifying before the commission, what would you want them to know yeah. that, that from your years of experience have made the most impact on you? Well, I would say that if a commission is going to look at reforming, further reforms that need to be done in Illinois, there should be the creation of an innocence commission that would be an impartial panel of judges that would hear evidence that when you have claims of actual innocence raised, when you have motions to have forensic testing under the post-conviction forensic testing statute to prove actual innocence, when you have those motions, that that gets heard before those bodies, an independent body, rather than go into local circuit court uh, 
where prosecutors fight to have that evidence tested, where they fight to have new evidence uh, discovered, that we should, I think the, the movement is to have uh, conviction integrity units. We should have a conviction integrity unit within the Illinois Attorney General that has oversight of the 102 state's attorneys who convicted these people to be able to indep truly independently review a conviction when it's brought to their attention and to have the power and authority to make it right once that exonerating evidence is, is uh, brought to light and actually join in the investigation on post-conviction. Uh, as an organization, one of our, uh, um, our third exoneration since we started within the last two years is a guy named Jonathan Fleming. Jonathan Fleming was convicted in New York in 1989 of a murder that happened while he was vacationing with his family at Disney World. The prosecutor argued in closing argument that there were 52 different flights Jonathan Fleming could have taken to travel back to Brooklyn to commit this murder. Well, it turned out when Jonathan Fleming was arrested, there was a receipt where he had made a phone call placing him in Orlando at the time of the murder, within 30 minutes of the murder. There's no way he could have taken that flight. Prosecutors and police had that evidence. It was inventoried when they arrested him. It was in his clothing when he was arrested. And it was a conviction integrity unit working with two private investigators who were members of our organization. Just um, in uh, uh, 2014, Jonathan Fleming walked out of prison after 20, almost 25 years because this evidence was uh, actually the Conviction Integrity Unit was worked hand in glove with the private investigators and produced this evidence that had been in police custody for 25 years. And it formed the basis of, of the Conviction Integrity Unit saying, we're releasing Jonathan Fleming. Is there any repercussions against prosecutors if they, if, if it's seemingly in that case we find, or in any case, we find that they purposely hid evidence in order to get a prosecution? There should be re conviction. repercussions. And, and part of the problem is, is that they're... Um, I mean, if it were a doctor or some other field, right. we, we'd hold them for malpractice. Well, right. And that the problem is, you know, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that um, prosecutors have uh, immunity for committing what are called Brady violations, where they hide evidence that might tend to exonerate a, an innocent person. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has said that they have immunity from being sued uh, for doing that type of thing. Um, you know, I think that you know the the it opens up the question about prosecuting some of these police and prosecutors who are caught hiding evidence and uh, you know uh, violating uh, someone's constitutional rights. Of the cases that you've covered, uh, which would be the most egregious? Would you say? Well. There's a lot of them that are egregious, but I, I would say, you know, the, the Rolando Cruz case where uh, I actually was a witness in the DuPage 7 case where seven police and prosecutors were actually indicted for their misconduct by a special prosecutor. Um, they were acquitted, but it's one of the few cases in American ju uh, judicial history where police and prosecutors have actually been indicted criminally for their misconduct. It's happened in a few other jurisdictions, but, but it's not many. It's the exception rather than the rule. You know, I think that the Illinois Attorney General should seriously consider uh, creating a, a statewide conviction integrity unit. Um, and I think the, uh, the Illinois Supreme Court should work with the General Assembly and the governor in, uh, in forming an innocence commission that would have the judicial authority to hear cases and where you have the, you know, uh, the Illinois Attorney General with the Conviction Integrity Unit um, serving as the, age, the, the, the prosecutor representing the state and the people. Let me, uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting, we, we go through a trial, someone's convicted, they're sitting either in jail or uh, they wouldn't be sitting any longer on death row, but they may have been in prison for, as you just say, decades. Mm -hmm. And then these college kids will get involved. Mm 
as different places where the uh, University of Illinois Springfield is one example. And these college kids who are untrained in, as investigators will look at the evidence and lo and behold they find something that leads to someone being released from prison. How is it possible that if un inexperienced college kids can find evidence that exonerates someone that our judicial system couldn't? Well, I mean, could you imagine the impact of a conviction integrity unit where they actually have investigators on staff and they have prosecutors committed to uh, discovering the truth? How big of a gap is there? We have this myth in our minds as citizens that we have well-intentioned people working in the criminal justice system that, that prosecutors don't want to send the wrong guy to prison, they want to get the right guy, and we presume that if they had evidence that would exonerate uh, someone who was charged that they, they would free them. Mm -hmm. Is there a major gap between how we imagine the criminal justice system works and how it actually works? There is. There's a major gap. I mean, you know, if people actually realized how dysfunctional the system really is, I mean, I think, uh, um, you know, the average person would be demanding some type of reform. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's one of those things that the average person, you know, has no idea how bad it can be in certain cases. And on one hand, we're talking about people who are innocent and being sent away. Does it work the other way where because of the inefficiency we have too many people who are guilty and should be locked up who are being let go? You know, it, it does work the other way. It does work the other way where, you know, incompetence can uh, lead to, you know, clues and evidence not being fully pursued and in investigating and leading to the apprehension of someone who's, who's uh, you know, committed a violent act. And part of that is just the lack of testing of the DNA evidence, where hasn't it been the case well, where sometimes we've they, had someone who's do. gone on to do serial rapes where they could have, they had been arrested and had we tested the DNA and put it through a database, we could have found out that this person, the DNA matches right, the right. evidence. In some cases, on. you know, the cases that are old and have been on the shelf, um, you know, these people who are still out there, that committed those rapes, and some of them are still reoffending, and so there's there's an issue to be made about providing the resources to, to have that evidence tested. How badly, it, it, to what extent is a lack of funding of our criminal proper funding of the criminal justice system a contributing factor in these cases where people are wrongfully convicted and where people who should be held right. are, are let go? Well, it, it's a big issue because even when we had reforms to prevent innocent people from receiving the death penalty, all a prosecutor had to do was decide not to seek the death penalty. And many of them did just because it deprived that person they arrested of those resources and uh, helped you know, uh, tilt the playing field in their favor. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, there, you know, one of the reforms in the death penalty, so many of the, the death penalty reforms was to create a statewide system of funding the hiring of investigators and qualified counsel and experts so you can discover and investigate evidence of your innocence before you're convicted. Well, after the death penalty went away, those, those reforms no longer exist. You know, unlike uh, Illinois doesn't have a statewide system for funding uh, public defenders. You know, every county is on their own. That was one of the things about the reforms in the death penalty system was that at least provided a statewide funding mechanism to devote resources to investigate one's innocence before trial. We don't have those resources now that the death penalty's gone away. And I've seen a number of cases. Uh, I can point to the case of Julie Ray, who's one of our exonerees at UIS. Her 10-year-old son is killed by a serial killer who's later executed in Texas. Um, the prosecutor in that case in ninth, uh, spring of 2000 um, convened a grand jury, started looking at her, 
uh, by the time they indicted her, she was facing capital murder charges. And this is one of the early, this is right after the reforms were enacted in January of 2000, provided uh, statewide funding to hire investigators, appointed counsel, experts. And once she filed a pro se motion, because she had been extradited from Indiana, she cited to a, the Supreme Court reforms that were about to take effect that guaranteed anyone facing the death penalty with the reforms of enhanced discovery, court, uh, two capital qualified attorneys. Once she filed that motion, the prosecutors decided to file their intent not to seek the death penalty. And they did that not because they had a change of heart on the death penalty, but they didn't want her to have those reforms that she was entitled to, the resources. And it wasn't until after she was convicted that the Illinois Innocence Project um, conducted the post-conviction investigation and developed evidence uh, proving that the serial killer killed her son. That we had the support of the Texas Ranger who investigated Tommy Lynn Sells. And yet, you know, and so that's, that's a case, an example where resources were deliberately taken away to tilt the playing field to ensure a conviction. And I think people uh, here again, the public might be shocked to find out that again, justice is reliant on what dollars are available for these trials. And we know the difference in education right. from one county to another, but we think the courts are going to be adequately funded and they'll have the resources to carry out their duties. But, but they're not. In many, uh, in many, many counties can't afford they couldn't afford to try a death penalty case. They needed those state resources. Uh, they'd go broke if they did. And the same if, uh, if they had to provide the, just the basic level of resources in a, in a major murder case. They couldn't, many of these counties can't afford that. And they don't. And again, it calls into the need for a statewide funding system for indigent defense. There was a, a case here where a family, I think a five, was killed recently up uh, in Lincoln. Oh, I was worked that case. And uh, it was bankrupting, basically, or close to bankrupting right. the county just right. by putting that trial on. The Beeson case, right. That's right. That's right. And so they, they continued to make that a death penalty case as long as they could to use those funds. Last question from me. When, when you have these issues uh, mm -hmm. of funding, to what extent are prosecutors haranguing the defendant to say, accept, a less, accept some plea where we'll send you to jail maybe for 10 years instead of us going after the death penalty just because they want to avoid the cost of trial? Um, that happened. I mean, they used the, uh, one of their arguments in maintaining the death penalty is what they took away their bargaining chip, their hammer that they used as leverage to exert pleas. But, you know, it's not, in my opinion, a, an appropriate use of the death penalty. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. 